Good afternoon. I have Brother Albert here um, with us, and he is uh, ready to start the Sunday school lesson. So um, let's go ahead and, uh, Brother Albert, can you say one, two, three, see if we have audio coming in? One, two, three, three, two, one. Perfect, perfect. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you. And thank you, folks, for joining us again. As always, we want to remind you to go ahead and start your uh, watch parties and uh, however it is that you share this um, service so uh, so that we can have many people listen to God's word today. Brother Albert has a beautiful background. He is actually in our church grounds in Kendall, and there's a beautiful building and gorgeous uh, trees and, and, and the greenery. I envy you, Brother Albert. I know it's a little warm out there, uh, but we appreciate you uh, your commitment to, uh, to this ministry. So I'm going to turn it over to Brother Albert uh, right now. God bless you. Good morning. Today we'll be... In a, a quarterly, the um, lesson number eight, Revela from the book of Revelation, chapter 18. So in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, we'll, we're going to be reading only verse 1 through 13, a, a partial reading of the chapter for, the, for the, today's lesson. Revelation chapter 18. Lesson number eight, but, but chapter 18 in the book of Revelation, verse 1 through 13. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird for a nation, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the ab abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her, even as she is rewarded, she has rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works in the cup which she hath filled fill to her double how much she hath glorified herself and lived dealt deliciously so much torment and sorrow give her for she saith in her heart i sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow therefore shall her plagues come in one day death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Verse 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived de deliciously with her shall be shall bewail her and lament her for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wheat and breast and sheep and horses and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. So that was Revelation chapter 18, verse 1 through 13. Now, uh, reading, from the, reading from the quarterly. Uh, today is the, the fall of Babylon. It's today's, and the key verse in today was uh, verse 4 and 5. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. God hath remembered her iniquities. That's uh, verses four through five. A first look. <clears throat> False religion had ex has existed from the beginning. Satan is real and he exerts powerful influence on the leaders of this world. Near the end of this age, a great false religion will dominate the world. Satan attacks the three great institutions God has given people to guide them in righteous conduct. These are the family, the nation, and the church. Please understand that though these are mentioned generically, each one is only manifest as local and visible. In recent times, Satan has had a great influence on all three. 
Eventually, the man of sin, also called the Antichrist, will dominate human government and ruling along with him will be the great whore of false religion. That domination will be short-lived, and in these verses, we learn of the eventual downfall of false religion of every kind. The one overriding fact about the false religion is that it is false. It is based on imagination and lies. It may be powerful and influential, but it is still false. Like relationship with a prostitute, it is an imitation of a real thing. Everyone involved may appear to be happy for a time, but when the truth finally comes out, that happiness will turn to sorrow. God wants us to know the eventual judgment he will send on false religion. These verses have detailed and for the most part self-explanatory. These main th the main thing taught here is that in the end, God cannot lose and Satan cannot win. Remember that at this time, Satan has already been cast out of heaven. He is confined to the earth and he knows that he only has a short time until the final judgment that casts him and his angels into the lake of fire forever. So we're going to read again, verse one through three, Revelation 18, verse one through three. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. In these verses, we read about the doom of Babylon and also the despair that this judgment will produce on the earth. This mighty angel with a strong voice gave three reasons for the downfall of false religion. First, false religion is unclean. It is the habitation of demons and foul spirits. This is important. Men regard false religion as neutral. Many today seem to think that there are many ways to find God and that religions are essentially equal. This is nonsense. Jesus did not believe this and neither should we. Uh, John 14, 6. Second, false religion is the home of devils and foul spirits of every kind. Take an honest look at the societies, the false religions the world have produced. Jesus gave us a hint of this in the parable of the mustard seed found in Matthew 13, 31 through 33. All kinds of birds lodged in the branches of this plant. This shows us how all kinds of ideas and heresies have infected and often overtake the Lord's true churches. Babylon will be judged because she has influenced the governance of the earth. The Lord said his true churches would be like salt and light. False religion is like alcohol. It clouds the judgment and causes men to make bad decisions. There's a very good reason why we are told not to make any important decisions while under the influence of chemical or drug. Finally, religion will have made many men wealthy at the expense of eternal truth. This may have been in the mind of Jesus when he warned men about gaining the whole world and losing their own souls. False religion may bring temporary wealth and pleasure, but the price for these fleeting pleasures is eternal damnation. It is easy for anyone to become fi um, fascinated with these things the world has to offer. When offered a little drink of alcohol or a tempting time of imitation pleasure, we may sell our souls for a mess of pottage. These plain and simple facts about the eventual destruction of false religion were given so that we will be warned and have the wisdom to avoid these traps and that, that are disguised as pleasure. Perhaps seldom have signs on them warning of the consequence of being entrapped, entangled in them. Just the opposite. The trap will look harmless and ordinary. It will look appealing and entice the unwary into it. Many people become hopelessly entangled in the things they never saw coming. Wise men will avoid these things. God says are that are wrong. Most people have barely enough good judgment to avoid trouble when they are sober and in their right minds. We cannot afford to make any decisions if we are drunk and deceived. Avoid the wine of fornication. A warning from heaven. Verse 4 through 8. Verse 4 through 8. Chapter, chapter 18, Revelation 18, verse 4 through 8. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have re reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, um, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. 
Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. The strong, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. John then heard another voice, uh, different from the one announcing the doom of Babylon, that gave a warning to God's people in all ages. This is the same message Paul wrote to the Corinthians concerning false religion in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Good people can be deceived by bad ideas. When we are, we need to separate ourselves from what God says is evil as quickly as, um, as we can. The reason is simple. There are ideas that are so wrong that there is no middle ground in them. There is no communion between light and darkness. There is no concord between Jesus and Satan. There is no common ground between a believer and an infidel. There is no agreement between the temple of God and idols, and our bodies are the temples of God. These are not theological conclusions. This is the word of God. We are being foolish when we try to find compromises and accommodations with things that we know to be wrong. This is why God simply tells us, come away from such things when we encounter them. Truth is true in all situations and for all time. People can be saved, even in false churches, when they search the scriptures and find the truth. Then, they should come out of false religion and as soon as possible, no matter what the cost. The reason is simple. The sins of the false religion have reached into heaven and are known to God. Men may think that one church or one way of worship is just as good as another, but God does not. He knows what is true. He has told us in his word what is true, and he expects us to follow the truth wherever it leads. The reward of false religion is sown in the seeds of its own behavior. This is the spirit, the spiritual law of retribution. We reap what we sow, and usually we reap far more than what we sow. False religion will be repaid double for its lies it tells and lives it ruins. The essence of false religion is found in verse 7. Uh, this is a desire to have the self-glorification of physical blessings at the expense of spiritual truth. It is a desire to sit as a queen and rule the world along with the man of sin. It is a desire to have all the delicacies of this world and to enjoy life no matter what cost. Sadly, this is a description of what many people desire from life. Power and wealth are severe masters who will drive us away from the truth of God's word if we follow them. The downfall of Babylon is swift and painful. Her downfall happens in one day. This suggests the swiftness of judgment when it is finally comes. This judgment is evidenced in four things, death, mourning, famine, and fire. Once again, it is obvious to the whole world that God hath judged the evil city, but no one is moved to turn to God. Verse 9 through 13. Revelation 18, verse 9 through 13. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and have lived deliciously with her shall be shall bewail her and lament her uh, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour it is, is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone and of pearls, and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine woods, and all manner of vessels, ivory, all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble, and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil, fine flour, the wheat and breast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. When we, when we believe a lie for so long, it becomes almost impossible to believe the truth. This is a real uh, seductive danger of false religion. It produces an inertia that reserves the, tr the truth even when the truth becomes obvious. When the, discussion of, when the destruction, destruction of false religion comes, the kings and merchants of the earth lament and mourn, not because they care about false religion, but because they themselves have suffered physical loss. No one would uh, buy their merchandise. They had learned the lesson of selfishness well. They only care that the great poor is destroyed because it will stop their personal pleasure and gain. False religion has been good for business. It made merchants and shipmasters wealthy. When this destruction suddenly comes, men are mourning because they have lost their way of life in a day. Note, that, uh, note how many uh, times the phrase one hour is repeated in these verses. 
false religion repeatedly re represents represented by the city of Babylon has been in existence for many years. Even at judgment, it appeared to be a, a permanent part of life on earth that would always be there. But in very short time, the world will be forever changed. And this evil city will be destroyed. All that is left is the smoke of her fire that is consumed that consumed it. Note once more that men mourn not because the city is gone, but because they will now suffer the loss of income. All the empty ships will now have no cargo to carry. And all the merchants will now have no business to pursue and will be devastated. This event draws a sharp contrast to the teaching of Jesus that we should lay our treasures up in heaven where nothing uh, and no one can destroy them. The voice of false religion will be silenced forever. But note that people will not automatically turn back to God. The nations of earth will ha have been deceived by the sorcery sorceries of false religion so much that they will reject the truth even when false religion is no longer present. Final word. We can learn from our experiences, but we can infer more from our uh, experiences that is truly that is truly in them. It is possible to come um, short of the truth, and it is also possible to go beyond it. In Jesus' day, the Sadducees came short of the truth by denying the existence of angels and spirits in the resurrection. And the Pharisees went beyond the truth by insisting that people pay tithes of their kitchen spices. Their spirit will be present in the end time events. When false religion is destroyed, people will not turn to the truth immediately and recognize that they were wrong and seek the truth from God's word. Instead, they will mourn because they lost what they once had. They lament the loss of personal wealth through activity made possible by this great world system of false religion. False religion glorifies itself at any price. It is willing to shed the blood of saints and prophets in order to accomplish its evil goals. But at this time, it will be forever silence. The death of Babylon is necessary in order for the truth that is Jesus Christ to come on to the world scene in power and glory. This is a truth about the future. We would know, we should know the truth and we should base our lives and our hope for eternity on the truth. And that concludes today's lesson number eight. And uh, next week will be lesson number nine, the marriage of the lamb, Revelation 19, verse one through 10. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Brother Albert. That was an awesome, awesome lesson. And uh, wow, a lot of information there that we need to uh, take care of uh, in our personal lives. All right, folks, we're going to continue with the worship part of the service. Uh, and before we do that, before we start, uh, we have a couple of songs that me and my wife are going to sing. Uh, and I hope you guys join us uh, at home. We're going to put the, uh, the lyrics. Uh, actually, we're going to display them all because my wife doesn't like to uh, to be on camera here at home. But regardless, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon uh, this service in each and every family. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be uh, in your presence today. Thank you so much for that Bible lesson. Thank you, Lord, for this technology that you uh, allow us to uh, to use for your honor and glory. Lord, we ask you that every uh, every word we say, every uh, every song, uh, every hymn that we that we sing, uh, everything, Lord, will be will be for your honor and glory. Lord, thank you once again for the Bible lesson. We ask you uh, for the for the sermon, and most importantly, Lord, if there's anybody listening to uh, watching this program, listening to my voice that has not personally accepted you as personal Savior, Lord, we ask you that you would convict their hearts. Uh, right now, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, folks, like I said, we have a couple of hymns that we'd like to, to sing, and I want you to join us, all right? So like I said, we're going to put the lyrics uh, here on the screen for you, and my wife and I are going to uh, to sing, uh, and, and like I said, I, I want you to join us at home uh, when, when we do this, and uh, it, then we'll continue with the rest of the service. Uh, all right, so let's do this.
another favorite there shall be showers of blessings amen and like i said earlier keep them coming all right keep those uh prayer requests and testimonies coming all right there shall be showers of blessing this is the promise of love there shall be seasons and from the Savior above, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Rounds and round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving the hills and the valleys, from the mountains we pray, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need, mercy round from the are falling, but for the truth we There shall be showers of blessing, send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us our refreshing, come and I honor your word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Around us are calling, but for the showers we shall be showers of blessing oh that today they might fall now as to god we're confessing now as on jesus we call showers of blessing showers of blessing we need mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we but for the showers we plead. Amen. Praise the Lord. All righty. Wow. Doesn't she sing beautiful? Ha <laughs> ha. She sings beautifully. I love it. But the trick here is that she won't appear on camera here at home. <laughs> She'll do it uh, at the church, but not here at home. But that's fine. Thank you so much, uh, Maggie, for uh, for this. Uh, praise the Lord. Amen. All righty, folks. Um, before uh, we go on, I have a couple of announcements to make. All right. And uh, first of all, of course, you all know that we have our uh, two opportunities uh, to worship with us. One, of course, uh, every Sunday at 3 p.m. We have our Sunday school and worship service starting at 3 p.m., as I said. And uh, all our services are online here on Facebook 
in life and uh, on Sunday normally we would be in person today we are not there uh, today so we are only online and then this coming uh, Wednesday night like every Wednesday at 8 p.m. I want to invite you to join me for a time of Bible study we usually uh, open the word uh, for about 45 minutes and we are uh, two weeks uh, from finishing our series of Bible studies on first and second Peter and this is getting better and better every week. So I want to uh, continue to um, uh, to share on First and Second Peter this coming Wednesday at 8 p.m. And um, also, if you would like to uh, give through our ministry, uh, of course, church members are already doing so, and I commend you for uh, your faithfulness. Uh, but if you are not a member of our church and you would like to contribute to this ministry, you can do so by going to our website, villagegreenbaptistchurch.org, and click on Giving. And it'll give you the instructions on how you can do so uh, as well. All right. Praise the Lord. We are very excited, uh, as I said, to be here uh, today. And uh, we're going to uh, go ahead with the, um, we have prayer requests that have come in. And I want us to uh, go ahead and um, and look at those right now. And so I'm going to open um our messages here and make sure I don't miss anything. And uh, so, folks, um, first of all, before I start reading here, I want to I want to say that we have been praying. Uh, we have been praying this week very, very uh, earnestly for uh, two pastors, friend of my friends of ours. Uh, one of them is Pastor Alex, uh, and uh, we share uh, the sanctuary with him. And uh, so he got sick. He's doing better. But we pray for his full recovery for his family as well. So please continue to pray for Pastor Alex. The other one is uh, Pastor Joe Harper. Brother Joe Harper, uh, he's 90 years old already. Uh, and um, he just turned 90, by the way. He is a personal friend and mentor of mine. And uh, we, we grew up, uh, you know, under his wing, if you will, in the ministry. He and his wife are responsible for many, many, many hundreds of souls uh, throughout the world because of their dedication to the mission work throughout the world entirely. Uh, and and it's, it's been amazing. But uh, Brother Harper uh, suffered a massive heart attack this week. And he was or he is in intensive care. And uh, he has been recovering slowly. And, uh, of course, he's ready to go uh, with the Lord uh, whenever God calls him uh, to be there. So we're asking that, uh, you know, if the Lord would choose to take him home, that he would not suffer. But uh, it, we're just asking for the Lord's will and for healing uh, for, for, for him as well. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead here and, and read. Uh, Sister Alba says, a prayer request. David and my business, uh, our health and our families. Uh, uh, walk with the Lord and testimony. Awesome. I love to hear testimonies, folks. Keep them coming. Work is good. My mom rested for a week. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, also, um, Sister Maria, Sister Maria Lenhart says, Praise, great praise. Uh, prayer short changes things. Amen. Amen. I agree. I thank the Lord, she says, for Danny, Shanti, and Nico. They're doing very well. Praise God. Pray for my family and friends, for protection and peace. Continue to pray for our country and our leaders, our presidents, doctors, and nurses. May they find a dedicate uh, a medication, excuse me, to cure this virus. May God bless our country. All right, amen. Sister Barbara Rivera says, praise uh, for Brother Harper. He's doing better. Uh, praying for full recovery soon. Pray for my family. Uh, and I'm... Um, Yes, I think you're the only one having difficulty with the audio, uh, Sister Barbara. I hope you fixed it. If not, let me know. Let us know. Uh, I know you're the only one because I was just having feedback from my phone. Um, our daughter Maggie uh, Fiorella, she says, pray for my family. So absolutely pray for, uh, for her. And I know we have other prayer requests. Uh, let me check here on the comment section just to make sure that I'm not missing anything. Uh, we have folks listening from uh, Costa Rica, watching us from Costa Rica as well. Um, so we want to pray for them as well. And uh, we know many, many missionaries uh, there and in other parts uh, of the world. So pray for them. Um, 
you know, there are many countries. We take it for granted here in America that uh, so many of our churches are open. We could be in our sanctuary, except we had a, a situation there where uh, the sanctuary was um, exposed to COVID. So that's why we're not there until it gets, um, you know, sanitized professionally. But um, but regardless, we, we are so blessed that we, we can actually meet in our in our buildings but in other parts of the of the world uh they are not able to they can't right now and so uh let's keep them in prayer they're being very very faithful in in having uh you know online services like we are right now but uh but let's keep them in prayer folks if you will join me in prayer for our pastors and missionaries around the world all right okay um I think it's time to pray for these prayer requests. And if you have a prayer request that you have not been able to uh, to send us, uh, that's okay. Uh, you can you can still uh, send them, and we'll pray for them on Wednesday, or and of course every day. The, the moment we receive them, I I share them unless you tell me it's a it's a, it's a private uh, matter. Uh, we'll share your prayer request with our uh, prayer warriors uh, in our church. But um, if, if um, you know if you have a prayer request and it's secret in your heart. Yeah, let's let's go to Lord in prayer and we'll we'll present them as well. All right. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be in your presence today, as always. And Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for the uh, answered prayer requests that we've heard. Thank you for those testimonies. Uh, thank you, Lord, because uh, we see your healing hand upon those that are sick. We see um, you healing uh, matrimonies, you, you you heal families, Lord, and, and we ask you for the healing of our nation, Lord, and our land in this sickness to go away, Lord. We ask you that you would uh, give, continue to give, and, and uh, you know the the knowledge and the wisdom that uh, researchers and doctors and, and nurses they they all need uh, to continue to combat and to uh, come victorious over this this virus. And Lord, we ask you that. Uh, you would answer each and every prayer request that is uh, in our hearts tonight, today, and that you would uh, answer them according to your will, that your will would be done. That's what we ask, Lord, that your will would be, would be done. Help us to accept your will, uh, regardless of our own personal uh, desires, and uh, we ask you that your name might be exalted. Thank you, Lord, for always supplying our needs, and we ask you for those uh, that are in need today, Lord, maybe folks that have, that have lost income, uh, lost their jobs, or maybe they have been uh, their their hours their hours have been reduced, and therefore their income has been affected. Whatever situation, we ask you, Lord, for these families, Lord, uh, as well. And uh, again, we ask you that you would continue in our midst and help me to present the the message that you've laid in my heart in the best way possible that many folks would be uh, encouraged and that folks would uh, come to the saving knowledge of jesus christ for it is in jesus name that i pray amen all right folks i can hardly wait to start uh preaching here and uh we have um we we've been uh talking and in, in, i've been preaching on the life of david uh here for uh several weeks now and so uh, i want us to continue uh on this and so we're going to um be doing part six today life of david part six i cannot believe time flies so much uh so so fast huh and uh, I guess when you're having fun, right, it, 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 it flies. And so we're going to be doing, like I said, um, the life of David, part six today. Um, folks, last week we discussed uh, how that God has, uh, was at work in the life of David as he was preparing uh, him for the time when uh, David would rule over uh, the nation of Israel. Folks, we know that God had removed all of David's crutches by, you know, from what we had studied the, the, the week before. And that was so that David might lean solely uh, and completely upon God. Uh, while in the cave, God surrounded David with his family, as we already studied, and with strangers who needed uh, a leader. Now, we know that David accepted this new challenge and he became their captain. David was about to face his greatest temptation, though, uh, on his way to the throne. He would have to deal with the temptation to seek revenge against Saul. I'll say that again, because this is very important. And, and I'll, I'll, 
I'll spend uh, quite a few, uh, quite some time here today on that. So David would have to deal with the temptation of revenge or seeking revenge against Saul. That was a temptation. We're, we're going to talk more about that, like I said. Every one of us, uh, of us folks, either has or will have, uh, you know, to deal with this as well. Um, sorry, let me close this here real quick. Okay. Um, I apologize for that. I closed, I closed my sermon. All righty. I apologize for that. Here it is. When you have a thousand things open that are all needed. Okay. So as I said, folks, it's very important. I'm going to stop here for just a minute because every one of us has or will have to face the same temptation in our lives. What am I talking about? The temptation to get even, the temptation to seek revenge. Now, what do we call that? Well, some folks call it my rights, my rights. No one is going to walk over me. <laughs> Others call it justified retaliation. Oh, I'm a fighter. It's in my blood. You've probably heard that. Maybe you have said it yourself. And then others say, I've done right. He or she has done wrong. I'm going to get him or her back because he or she deserves it. <laughs> Folks, now what does God have to say about that? Let's look at scripture. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through uh, 19. Romans chapter 12, 17 through 19, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And then verse 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give peace unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Wow. So, here, let me close this. I have another scripture for you. In Hebrews chapter 10, in uh, verse 30. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30. It says, For we know him that has said, vengeance belongs unto me. And he said, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Again, lo the Lord shall judge his people. Wow. So, why do we do this though? Why do we do this? Um, okay. Excuse me. Well, I have three reasons, three possible reasons why people react the way they react or why we, because I'm included. Sometimes I, I have these reactions myself. Injury. We have been personally hurt and treated unfairly. So we feel the need to, you know, get even, get revenge, however you want to call it. Another reason is vulnerability. The one who caused the injury lets down his or her guard. So now we want to take advantage of that. Depravity. Because sensing that vulnerability, our carnal nature strikes out to get even. Notice I said carnal nature. Because this does not come from the Spirit. Our desire to get even does not come from God. It comes from our flesh, from our carnal minds, and we need to get rid of that. So let's study, let's look, let's see how David... The man who was after God's own heart, let's see how he met this subtle tempt temptation in life. So first of all, let's survey the activity, okay? And I'm going to walk you through what happened in 1 Samuel chapter 22. I'm not going to read it. I'm going to give you the references. And uh, if you want to open the scriptures and go through it as I am talking, uh, that is perfectly fine, of course. So I'm going to give you the references. Or if you're taking notes, you can write them down. 
let's survey the activity. It's a summary of what went uh, on, all right, that brought David to where we are today. And today we'll be studying in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 22. That is our, 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 main, uh, our main course, if you will. 1 Samuel chapter 40, uh, 24, verses 1 through 22. And like I said, we, we'll get to that uh, uh, in a few minutes. But I want us to survey uh, the activity, what has gone on, going, uh, been going on here uh, so far. Okay, in, uh, in 1 Samuel 22, verses 3 and 4, David takes his family to Moab, all right? And he, and, and he takes his family to, know, to Moab uh, to dwell there until it is safe again, all right? And, and then in verse 5, again, this is all 1 Samuel 22, okay? Now, in verse 5, uh, David and his followers leave the cave, and they go to a forest in Judah. Now, Saul orders the priests to get to be killed. And, and this is a very terrible account that we find in 1 Samuel 22, verses 6 through 19. And again, if you're taking notes, I, I, I really, really subject, suggest that you read this, even as I'm talking to you. Uh, but I, I'm going to tell you what happened here in a, in a, in a couple of sentences. Uh, there was a man by the name of Doeg, and he was an Edomite. And what happened is he was there uh, when, when, when David uh, visited Ahimelech. So, Dave, uh, excuse me, this, this man Doeg, uh, the Edomite, he reported to Saul that Ahimelech had given David the showbread and Goliath's sword. Um, and so Saul went ahead and took that information and he charged Ahimelech with conspiracy. And he ordered that he and his household be executed. Obviously, Saul took things, completely blew him out of proportion. And, and he did this horrible, horrible thing. So Saul's men refused to carry out the execution. Listen to that. But you know what happened? Doeg, the Edomite. Because he was not an Israelite, he was an Edomite. So really, he didn't. He could care less if there were, uh, you know, God's men. If there were, uh, you know, soldiers. If they were just whatever. He he didn't he, he didn't care, and and he killed God's men, uh, eighty five priests in total. He killed them all. So Saul then destroyed every living thing in Nob, the city. Uh, of the priests. Very, very sad account. Verses 20 to 23, we read how uh, Abiathar, one of uh, Ahimelech's sons, he escaped and he brought the news to David. So evidently he, uh, you know, he, he was, somehow he escaped. He was hiding, I guess. He he was not part of uh, of the massacre, praise the Lord. But, but he escaped that and he came to David. He gave news. And so David, uh, you know, news came to David of the sorry condition of the city of Kaila, uh, or Kaila, in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. And the Philistines had been robbing the, the, the threshing floors after the hard work of harvesting and pro, uh, processing the grain had been, all, had been done by the men of that city. So the Philistines, uh, you know, thought it easy to just come and, and rob uh, them of, of, of their fruits, you know, uh, of the fruit of the labor. So although it was not his direct responsibility to defend this city, David did so after inquiring of the Lord. Again, this is all found in verses 1 through 6. And so David and his army were victorious uh, over the Philistines. So Saul received the news in verses 7 through 12, he received the news that David had gone to the city of Kila and mistakenly thought that God had delivered David into his hand. I'll say that again, folks. Saul mistakenly thought, he misinterpreted, he mistakenly thought that God had delivered David into his hand. And I wonder how many of us, folks, misinterpret. We, we misunderstand God's will. Because perhaps we read stuff out of context or we are trying to find, you know, trying to hear what we want to hear. Folks, we cannot go to the scriptures to try to prove our point. We cannot go to the scriptures uh, and, and, and to try to prove that we are right, that we have 
uh, we, we want to do this and we're trying to find, uh, you know, biblical proof to, um, to confirm that this is God's will. We can't do that. And so, because we will commit mistakes like Saul did. Now, the Bible says, and again, verses 7 through 12, that Saul called all the people together for war, uh, thinking that he had David trapped. Well, David inquired of the Lord again about his safely, knowing Saul's anger toward him. So the Lord revealed to David that the man of the city of Kila, the man that he had helped, right? The man that he had intervened uh, to help against the Philistines, they would actually turn him over to Saul. You know, that's people for you. You cannot trust in people. Okay, we cannot trust in people. I'm not saying to be untrusting. What I'm trying to say is we need to trust in the Lord because people, as, as, as people, we fail. All right, we fail others. People fail us. That's part of human nature. So we need to trust in the Lord. But anyhow, so David was betrayed by these men, if you will. And uh, verses 13 through 29, again, 1 Samuel chapter uh, 23, if you're taking notes, in verses 13 through 29, we see how David and his man headed into the wilderness with Saul pursuing him every single day. Can you imagine? And that is a very, you go ahead and read that chapter, chapter 23, 22 and 23. Uh, very interesting, very sad to see how Saul, uh, in my opinion, lost his mind. He was focused on destroying David and capturing David and killing David, and he lost his mind completely. While in the wilderness, David met with Jonathan and received encouragement. Somehow Jonathan uh, was able to, you know, to, 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 to trick his dad, I guess, so he wouldn't find out, but he, he went and saw his friend David and he encouraged him. That's what a true friend does, folks. And we need some of those true friends in our lives. Amen. Saul, Saul continued to pursue David and he eventually uh, had him surrounded. Now, at that point, the messenger came to Saul with the news that the Philistines were invading the land. And uh, so Saul had to stop his pursuit of David, which allowed David the chance to escape to Engadi. All right. Okay, so now that takes us to our passage here today in 1 Samuel chapter 24. All right. 1 Samuel chapter 24, and uh, this is this is the situation, all right? I, I have labeled this part of the sermon, the situation, all right? So let's look at 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 and 2, if you will. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 and 2, all right? That's uh, the wrong one. Here you go. Okay. It says, And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engadi. And he came to the, the, to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Um... Okay, let me see. I lost my spot here for a minute. Let's go ahead. All right, I lost my spot here for a minute. Yeah, only verse one and two. Okay, because I have this whole thing all together here. Okay, I'll read three in just a minute. So David and his 600 men were encamped in the wilderness of Engadi. And the advantage was with David, folks, since he had been able to become established in that location. He knew, you know, that location very, very well. He had already been there for a while. Saul returns from the pursuit of the Philistines and he chooses 3,000 men and immediately goes after David. All right, so let's look at verses 3 to 7, okay? Now, now let's look at the temptation here. Um, and and this, is, this is quite serious, very interesting. But let's look at verses 3 to 7. 1 Samuel 24, verses 3 uh, to 7, all right? And it says, And he came to the sheepcoats by the way where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet, 
All right. And David and his men remained in the sites of the cave. Verse four says, David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. All right. What did I do? I think I misread this. All right, I'm sorry. I clicked the wrong thing. Skipped verses. I didn't read verse 4, did I? I don't think so. All right. Here's the important thing. In verse 4, folks. Verse 4 says, And the men of David said unto him, This is a temptation, all right? Remember, Saul goes into the, uh, into the cave, David's men, David and his men, they go to the sides, you know, they, they know how to hide, where to hide. As I said, David had the advantage. They had been there for several uh, weeks already, probably months. So the men of David told them, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of David's, uh, excuse me, of Saul's robe, privately and it came to pass afterward that david's heart smote him because he had cut off saul's skirt and verse 6 says and he said unto his man the lord forbid that i should do this thing unto my master the lord's anointed to stretch forth uh, mine hand against him seeing that he is the anointed of the lord and verse 7 so david stayed his servants uh, with these words and, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave, the cave and went on his way. Now, um, we, we see, we see here how, uh, you know, the temptation went on folks. And so let, let's look at, at the, a few, a few things here. Suddenly Saul becomes vulnerable. All right. This powerful man, 3,000 men with him, uh, you know, this powerful king Saul, 3,000 men with him now becomes vulnerable. Because at one point or another, folks, uh, even the stronger man, the strongest man, uh, they have to use the bathroom, they have to sleep, uh, they have to uh, wash up and take a shower, they have to do things that put them in a vulnerable position, all right? And that's exactly what is taking place here with Saul. Now, while searching for David, we know that Saul enters the cave, as I said, in order to relieve himself. And David and his men were hiding in that very cave because I said, as I said earlier, he knew, they knew exactly where they could hide safely in this cave. So I want you to note, notice the, the encouragement of these men, as I said earlier, because David's men encouraged him to take revenge. And folks, in our lives, we're gonna hear people encouraging us to take revenge, to take matters into our own hands. To go ahead and do what's right, right? Because, uh, you know, we've been wrong and whatever. And there's a lot of that going on right now. They essentially told David, God has brought him here so that you can do this. Folks, be careful, as I said, with the encouragement of others, especially those that call themselves Christians, because we can't take that as a justification for our actions. You have to be very, very careful. We must be sure that we are doing what God wants us to do. All right, be very, very careful. We have to be very responsible, measure the consequences of our auction, actions based on God's word. So at first, David honestly responded in the flesh. Why did I, do I say that? Because he reached out and he says that he cut off uh, the fabric of Saul's robe. He could have killed Saul and gladly he didn't. All right, but he did play some games with him. Uh, and, and folks, even that was wrong. God responded in the spirit in verse 5. David's conscience bothered him. All right. I believe that was from God. He knew that he was wrong almost immediately. And, and David was miserable for what he had done because he had violated, you know, a godly principle. So David conquered his temptation as we read in verses 6 and 7. How? Well, he reminded himself and he reminded his men, uh, his men of this principle that, that, that no one should put hand his they, their hand on, on, upon the anointed of, of God. No matter what Saul may have been, he was still God's anointed. He kept his men from doing the same, the Bible says, and he allowed Saul to leave the cave unharmed. 
Now, there's a very interesting conversation that takes place after this in verses 8 through 22. And so I want us to read that, all right? Verses 8 through 22 in 1 Samuel chapter 24, uh, because it's, it's, like I said, a very interesting uh, conversation, all right? And I'll break it down after uh, after we, we're done reading it here, okay? So let's, let's go over that uh, right now. The Bible says, again, verse 8, David also arose afterward, and, uh, and, and he went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth, and he bowed himself. In other words, he, he, he paid reverence to the king. In verse 9, And David said to Saul, Wherefore, hearest thou man's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today unto my hand in the cave. And some bade me to kill thee, but my eye spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord. For he's the Lord's anointed. And, and I want you to you know, underline, mark, highlight, however you mark your Bible. Because this is a very important verse. This is, this is conviction here, folks. And this is the type of conviction that we need in God's men and women today. And then verse 11, he continues. He says, Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For... In that I cut off the skirt of my robe, of thy robe, and killed thee not. Know thou, wow, know thou, and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. Ouch. That's called confrontation. Verse 12. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee. But my hand shall be, shall, excuse me, shall not be upon thee. In verse 13, as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall be, sh shall, shall be, excuse me, uh, shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee. And see and plead my cause. And deliver me out of thine hand. Verse 16. And it came to pass when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul. That Saul said... Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice, and he wept. And the Bible says in verse 17, And he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. And thou hast showed me, excuse me, showed this day how that thou hast dealt well with me for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killedest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. In verse 20 he said, And now behold, I know well that thou uh, shalt surely be king, Notice the words of Saul now. This is Saul speaking. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thy hand. And listen to what he says next. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me. He had already done that with Jonathan, by the way. And that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And then he says, and David swore unto David, excuse me, unto Saul. And Saul went home, but David and his man 
get them up uh, uh, unto the hold. Wow. What a passage of scripture right here, folks. That is a mouthful. Uh, that's why I read it slowly, and, and, and uh, I hope I did some justice. Uh, again, I cannot emphasize this enough, folks. Read, study these, these two, three chapters that we're talking about today. Uh, 1 Samuel 22, 23, 24. So let, let's go over this, uh, this situation here. As I said, th this is the conversation between uh, King Saul and, and David. So, first of all, stuff that David said to Saul, all right, verses 8 through 15 uh, give us the account that, uh, of the things that David said to Saul or did. First of all, David shows Saul respect, verse 8. David indicates that Saul was acting on misinformation, verse 9. David gives verbal proof of his innocence in verse 10. Then David presents tangible evidence that he has no desire to hurt him. Verse 11. That's when he showed him, you know, the, the, the corner of Saul's skirt that he had cut off. And then verses 12 to 15, David calls on Saul to let God judge between them. You see, folks, and these are all steps that we should take into consideration and we should follow when, we, when, there, when there's need uh, in our lives for confrontation. Now, let's look at Saul's response to David, verses 16 through 22. Number one, Saul was convinced by David and weeps over the situation, verse 16. And before I move on, I want to say, folks, that I believe that not only God touched Saul's heart on this, but I believe David's words and David's actions really touched Saul, all right? And this is something that we need to take into account. As I said, when, whenever we have to deal, uh, you know, with confrontation, we, we'd be wise to follow David's example and, and because it will produce a good result. Uh, that's my conviction. So Saul acknowledges David's righteousness in verse 17. Then he accepts David's words and seeks the blessings of God for David's right actions, verses 18 and 19. And after that, we see how Saul now acknowledges that David will indeed be the king of Israel and requests protection for his family. Honestly, I think that Saul was being a little coward again uh, when he does that. The way that he requests protection, uh, it's just my personal opinion. You don't have to agree with me. But then they both agree on this covenant and they depart. But folks, again, these three chapters are full of wisdom here. Uh, and, and also, you know, from David's part, and also we can see his human, you know, his human side, uh, how he made a mistake, how, uh, you know, folks uh, gave him a bad report, or gave advice, a bad advice, he followed to some extent, we need to be careful who we listen to, and, and then of course we see that David repented immediately, and he made it right. And so that's a great example. But we also see uh, the, the, the foolishness of Saul as he was listening to the same type of voices, if you will. Uh, and, and he misinterpreted the scriptures. And, you know, when we want to make the Bible say what we want to hear, then, you know, you, you take stuff out of context. And evidently that's what Saul did. And it brought him all, all kinds of trouble. So in conclusion, folks, I want to say David chose to do what was right in the sight of God not the side of man. And this experience is in tune with the principle given years later by his own son, Solomon. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 7, uh, he, uh, he said, And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. Oh, excuse me. There you go. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. I'm going to leave those up there so that or down here so that you can see those. And I want to finish with this question. What can we learn from this event in the life of David? Folks, this is not just a, a Bible story. This is an account. This is this is something that took place in real life. These are real events. This is these are real people that lived on this earth 
that walk this earth just like you and I are walking this earth today, folks. And it's very important that we understand that God allowed all this to teach us a lesson or two. And I believe, folks, in times like we're living today, I know it's difficult to deal with certain people. I know that. I'm a human too. I interact. I have a job. I have a business. Indeed, I, in fact, I have two businesses. And, 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 and folks, it is difficult to deal with certain types of people, especially nowadays. There's a lot of confusion with the virus, with, you know, what is your opinion on this or that or the other? And, and it's very easy to get tangled in a conversation. I see it all the time, even on social media. You see it discussions and, and situations uh, happening. We need to be careful. As God's people, we need to set the example. We need to share God's love. And I really hope and pray that you have felt God's love through my words, through this service, through the words of Brother Albert, through the songs that we have uh, shared here with you. But most importantly, the Lord said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life if you're listening to my voice and you have not trusted jesus christ as personal savior i want to extend a personal invitation for you to open your heart to the lord ask him to forgive you of your sins and ask him to come into your life as personal savior if you do that please let us know we would love to pray with you we would love to to meet you to give you some materials to to share the word of God with you in a personal way and I want to extend an invitation for you to join us this coming uh, Wednesday at 8 p.m. for Bible study as I said earlier and then again of course next Sunday we have another appointment at 3 p.m. and uh, until that appointed time God bless you